to uh, my YouTube page. They'll be able to watch it. If people aren't here, they can watch it. Is everybody done with the, the um, I think that's the third, third assignment? How do you guys do it? Are you getting close to finishing or yeah. almost there? Did you want to do a PDF? Yeah, just do a PDF. Okay. We'll wait a few more minutes.
So this is um, the uh, class right now. So it's on YouTube. So I'm broadcasting this live on YouTube right now. So the um, so if you go to this, I'll send everybody the link um, on Canvas, and then you can go back to it and watch this if you want. You know, if there's something that you're confused about, you need to refer back to something. Well, it's going to be there for you to see. And the other thing is if you can't make it to class and this is, um, you, know, you just want to watch their class, well, it's going to be. will probably be today. I don't know why this is a coronavirus this series. Well, they're actually planning some meetings. And there's a slight delay so you can hear myself. So what's going to happen is you get inception. Um, so I have to turn the volume down because I don't want that. So that should be good. So yeah, that that was me coming through. Then um, we do all sorts of crazy stuff, I guess. The pens are here, by the way. If you need a pen, and I just need to see myself so I can adjust the camera. That's why I turned the screen around like that. So what are you doing? I'm, I'm broadcasting the class. You guys are... We're gonna be on TV? You guys are on TV. <laughs> so the, the world can see you. It, they can only see you if the camera's pointing at you, of course. So. We need to fix our hair. Yeah, so fix your hair. <laughs> Look good. Whoa. Oops. I lost the... Okay. Just trying to adjust this a little bit. Well, you can hear yourself again. Yeah. There is a slight, slight delay, which is kind of cool because you can plan things out properly. If there's a slight delay, I can. See if there's a mistake there. Okay, there. That's better. Um, okay, I just have to adjust the camera just a little bit more. How's everybody doing with assignment three then? Are you guys almost done? Okay. You guys, you're done? You're, everybody is everybody pretty much done? Is anybody still working on it? A couple people? Alright, um, We'll try to um, finish it up today. 
Thursday, there is no class, right? Oh, this Thursday? Coming up this Thursday, there's no class. It's um, a flex day. It's personal development day for um, faculty and staff. Um, so yeah, you guys have like a day off. Wow. I did not know that. And, okay. and we'll see what happens with, with the uh, this coronavirus thing too. Maybe we'll have the rest. Well, this is what will happen. Classes will not be canceled in any way. School will go on. We'll just go online. faculty will try to uh, try to teach online. Mm -hmm. You know, using different techniques. So this is one of the things we can do. Is like right now I'm broadcasting live. Basically, it's called a Slink Studio. So there's a box over there that's like a hub, and I have the HDMI connected to it. And that way, it's kind of nice because you know there's nothing stopping us from at class, and you can continue forth with your studies uninterrupted. So it's a nice thing to have. Plus the fact. We can go back and review the video. So if there's anything that you have questions about or you got stuck anywhere, you can even add comments um, to the video itself. So you can ask me you know, questions about anything. So if you have questions, <coughs> you can add them here. See, it's adding it right now. What is the keyboard shortcut? to increase your font size in Illustrator. So I asked a question, so what is it? Do you, get, do you remember what the keyboard shortcut is to increase the font size? Anybody can remember? Well, on a PC it's shift control and it's the Greater than less than symbols, or the minus, or I'm sorry, the comma, or the period key. So shift control, comma, shift control, period. That's to increase or decrease your fonts. And I'll be showing you more of these shortcuts because we're going to start talking about typography. On the Mac, is it shift uh, uh, command? Yeah, on the Mac, it's um, shift command. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just remember those shortcuts. So today we're going to talk about typography in more details. And the assignment focuses more on typography. And it's really meant to get you exploring the different fonts within Illustrator and some of the different ways you can use fonts to convey moods. And to give you a little overview too of the history of typography itself and how fonts developed. So I have a couple presentations I want to show you. And then what we'll do is go over, we'll go over the, uh, the logo assignments. We'll have a quick critique on the logo assignments. But when I give you your next assignment, assignment four, what I want to do is watch that Helvetica documentary. Remember how I showed you the documentary on Helvetica? So we can watch that as we work. So I'm going to present that today since we're on that part of the class where we're getting into typography. So first off, I want to kind of go through a little history. I have a book here that I scan. It kind of takes you through a very, very quick history of some of the typesetting techniques. And I just want you to see, <coughs> see how typesetting has evolved and changed and how the method of creating typography and laying out type, how the actual tools basically were uh, informing how the type was actually designed. So this is a very, um, this is the first <coughs> means of setting type. And 
So um, basically, you had these cases, and the term uppercase and lowercase came from how the different type specimens were organized within the cases. So that's where that name case comes from. Literally within this case itself, everything was organized um, line by line. And you kind of see here these diagrams. These were how the type was placed on the actual um, the actual metal that the type is constructed on. So you had different ways to space out the type and actual pieces of lead were used to separate the lines within those cases. So that's where the term leading comes from. You can kind of see how the thicknesses were used to actually spread out the type. So here's an example of the case. So you have everything organized within that case. And this is where the type was actually hand set. So you would hand set it line by line. But eventually, with digital technology, things evolve. As things change, so the, the way fonts were designed. So you have an evolution of the look and feel of the font throughout history, depending on the type of machine that was used. Now, this is um, it's really kind of hard to see, but that's a Linotronic machine. You had this other machine called the Monotype machine. And there's actually examples of this in the library. There's two machines. I forget what types of machines those are, but they if you go to the library on the, um, the north side of campus along Colorado. The exit on the Colorado side, you'll see two of these machines, early type setting machines. And a lot of this gave way to uh, a new technology called phototype setting. So after you had these linotronic type machines and these um, this machine is called a uh, monotype. So two variations of that. You had something called linotronics. And what, line of, what a linotronic machine did was actually uh, take a photo of the, There was a, a way to develop the fonts through a photographic process. And then the layout was actually done photographically. There was something called ruby lift. So there was this material that would block out the light, and basically the typesetter was cutting out type line by line using exacto knives and doing paste ups, and then taking a uh, photographic image. So that was probably like in the 60s, 70s, where photo typesetting was popular. The earlier methods of using metal handset type that was something that progressed for over 200 years until phototype setting came. And that gave way to current desktop publishing. A lot of the desktop publishing technology was <coughs> developed through uh, Xerox PARC. Part of the Xerox Corporation had a research and development um, center up in uh, Palo Alto, and the idea behind Illustrator actually came out of that center. Um, it was uh, John Warnack, and he was the one who, as part of a thesis project, uh, was working on Bezier's and coming up with means to create this process back in the 70s. And, and that kind of revolutionized how type was created. So it really changed the means that people were able to create type on the page itself. So that's where digital uh, technology came about. So I have this other presentation that kind of goes through 
plots themselves. And it gives you a better understanding of what the plot is and the actual anatomy of a fawn. Typography is the mechanical arrangement of words in a way that communicates meaning and content. It is concerned with both the creation of typefaces and their arrangement in a composition. So there's different interchangeable terms that describe type. So type is a physical object. It's that piece of metal that with the raised face that you saw. And then you can describe it as a font. So the term font, I don't have it in the presentation, but fonts came out of the factories, basically, that created the various forms of uh, typography. And those factories were called foundries. And that's where the word font comes from. And then the term typeface designates the whole family revolving around one type design. So when you hear the terms Roman, italic, gold, Old italic, that is the whole typeface. So type is the actual physical object, the font is the group of characters, and the typeface is the whole family. So with letter forms, you have our alphabet, and you have the various shapes that make up letter forms. When you get the term oblique, that's generally uh, diagonal. That's the diagonal part of the letter form. So you'll hear that term a lot. And then letter forms will be described by their base, basic shape. So there's a whole uh, nomenclature in terms of the way fonts are described in terms of the actual shape themselves. So just in general, because of the way we perceived typography over time, and as you're designing, you should know that if you separate a word horizontally, cut it in half, it's the top half that is recognizable, and the bottom half generally isn't recognizable. So you tend to recognize typefaces based on the top half. So if I kind of hid that bottom half, you would still generally make out what that word is. Right? What is that word? Horizon. Horizon, right? So you generally know. So there's a part of the brain that basically makes that connection. You could say it's a gestalt psychology where you recognize the whole thing based on the part. And same way with the right side. The right side of the letter is more recognizable than the left side. So when you think about using type and the way type is used, you know, when you're being creative with typography and you still want to ensure readability, just think about how you can do things to manipulate the font itself. You know, top half, you can still read it. You know, right side, you can generally still read it. It's the left side and the bottom half that's uh, hard to make out. So this is kind of going through the various terms describing parts of a letter form. So this gets really in-depth. So when you talk about different types of fonts and the different uh, different groups of fonts that exist, you start to talk about these general features. And you know, I don't expect you to remember these things, but in terms of uh, you know the, the tail of a cube or with the um, with this A, you know, the swash of the A. So all of these terms tend to get the details. The ones that you generally will remember are the serifs, so the bracketing at the ends of this A, and the counter, so the space that's inside of the letter form. So here with the A itself, that's the counter. Inside the uh, R, that's the Q. The, and the Q, that, that's the counter inside there. 
So those are the general kind of most common terms. You know, the stem of a letter form two. And here is more, more details. So you can talk about the lay of a letter form, or you get into more details of even the type of serif. So there's uh, different types of brackets for those serifs for different letter forms. So here's more details as well. So each font has its own unique design. It was designed you know, specifically for the for a different purpose, or it was designed because historically the device that was used to set the type uh, needed that design feature. And you'll see with um, as type progresses throughout history, as you get into like photo setting and digital type, that's when the serifs start to disappear. It, it became less necessary and designers exper experimented a little bit more with typography. So when you talk about fonts, with metal type, the fonts is a collection of all the metal pieces representing the complete set. And it also represents a, the same weight, style, and point size. Different point sizes of the same design are considered different fonts. So with metal typesetting, the uh, different point sizes were designed differently. So each point size was a particular design. Because you had to design each point size uh, individually when you lay that type out. In digital type, the font refers to the uh, whole character set, and the size is independent. So with digital fonts, you scale it up, and typically the size or the shape doesn't change. But with metal type setting, the, the uh, shapes change based on the size of the font. So type family includes Roman, Italic, Old, Old Italic. It's all the variations and styles that relate to that design. And it includes, it can usually um, well, include display font. So a display font is a title case font used for signage. And then there could be um, sometimes uh, coordinating serif, sans serif, other versions of the typeface. But generally, all the type styles within the family share common characteristics, such as x height, cap height, uh, length of the ascenders and descenders. So a typeface should be harmonious when you look at that typeface. So here are more details about naming conventions with a font. So the baseline is the line that the characters sit on. So when you're using type on a path in Illustrator, you know, if that is a straight line, or you know, rather it's on a curve, so the line that that type is on is the baseline. You know, typically it's an invisible line that you don't see, but if you're using the pen tool to draw that path, you'll see it. Uh, if the you have parts of the letters that overshoot that line though. So the design of the font will typically not rest right on that line. So like the tip of the A, parts of the O, those are called overshoots. So here you see more details of the naming convention describing how the different parts of the font coexist on the baseline. So with lowercase letters, you have a descender and an ascender. And then you also have something called an x height. And the x height is based on the height of a lowercase x. So generally, the x height would determine that size of the font. So every font has its own x height. Then you have your um, cap height for the uppercase. And you have what's called the mean line. So the baseline is the line, the uh, bottom half of that font is on, and then the x height determines where that mean line is. Like the P? <coughs> uh, the P, the lower part of the P, that's, that's called your descender. 
So generally, all of your descenders will be at the same depth based on design, the same way with your ascenders. That's what keeps the harmony within the type itself. So here are two different types of serifs, and these different types of serifs kind of denote the type of font. So you have a bracketed serif, and we'll go through different types of fonts. So bracketed serifs are your old style, <coughs> old style fonts, you have uh, transitional fonts, and then your um, bracketed serif, the A down here, these are um, your Egyptian style fonts, or they're called pleurodons. Both convey a different type of feeling, and that's what you have to think about when you're using typography. You know, what type of feeling is the font conveying? You know, a, um, unbracketed serif, usually where it ends at a sharp angle, that conveys a certain type of structure. Usually that's the type of font that you'll see for um, sports teams, you know, college sports teams for some reason tend to use these fonts. The bracketed serif has this kind of traditional feel to it. So there's a certain kind of formality, formalism with the bracketed serifs. There's this elegance that goes along with it, something that's pre-modern, um, would have that bracketed, bracketed type serif. And then if it has no serif, that's where you have a sans serif. Sans serif fonts don't have a serif at all. That's when you get into more modern type fonts. That's where you have Helvetica's and geometric fonts and fonts that kind of point to the future, let's say, or even styles that are um, less conservative can be portrayed with a sans serif um, font. So here is some um, X heights of different fonts, but the point of showing you this is that the X height is not a standard height. So every font has its own unique X height, but the X height generally determines the readability and how a font feels on the page itself, or how the font feels within a certain composition. So the X height basically is proportional to the rest of the A centers and B centers of the font itself, but every font will have its own unique X height. So here I'm going to start to go through um, these various fonts throughout history and kind of give you a better feeling for what each font as it's designed, it has its own, um, where it has its place in history itself. So humanist fonts, these are the first fonts that were derived from 15th century um, designers, basically beginning with um, drawing the font out with the uh, quill. So there's not a lot of great contrast between thick and thin strokes. So when people talk about thick and thin strokes, they're talking about the stems and the arms of the T, let's say. So generally, the stems and the arm is going to be the same width. Uh, the cross stroke of the E is oblique. So if you look at this E, it's at an angle. So that's kind of common among these early humanistic fonts. And the serifs are also bracketed. So the design of this font was really based on the hand and the quill drawing it out on parchment, let's say. The reason you call it humanistic, because it does convey that it was um, created with the human hand. So if you ever hear that term, um, you know, something that's humanistic or humanist, that means it was done with the human hand itself. So there's a certain feel to that type of font. Next you have old style, so this is late 15th century to early 18th century. So with old style fonts, they start to lose some of the handwritten characteristics. You start to see um, more contrast between the thick and thin strokes with the uh, stems and the arms. The, there's less of an incline 
with the uh, curved strokes. And then you begin to lose some of the bracketing on the serifs themselves. So this is where you start to get into more metal types. You still have a, you have a small X height, but it's starting to get a little bit larger than the humanistic fonts. So you're starting to see the evolution from fonts that were designed by hand to fonts that are actually being cast in metal. And that type of design style is starting to appear within the font itself. So things are starting to get a little bit more um, geometric with typography. So you have this next class of fonts called transitional, and you're starting to see more contrast between fixing the thick and thin, thin parts of the font, more bracketing on the serifs themselves, and this is the bridge between old style and modern design. So this is why it's called transitional. This is where typographers are starting to make more creative choices within designs themselves. You see like the balls on the uh, E and the G. Uh, there's less obliqueness in the font. So we start to see more perfection designed within the geometries of the font themselves. Things are starting to get straight, straighter, uh, more uniform. So this is considered a modern font. So the Dodonis, uh, these typefaces are characterized by strong contrast between fixed and thin strokes. Uh, fine serifs with no bracketing, strong vertical stress. And they tend, because they have that contrast, they tend to have this um, vibrational quality on the page. So this type of font is good for setting headlines and um, titles and maybe signage, but not so good for a large amount of text because of that quality. What's interesting is when you start to get into setting type for uh, readability purposes where you have a lot of text on the page, it's the old style um, and the humanistic fonts that are best for large amounts of text. That's why most books, if you look in a, you know, most books or your textbooks, that's why they're still set mostly with these types of fonts. Printed, printed page, you know, on the printed page. Um, starting to be a little bit more experimental in their work. And they really wanted, you know, to think about commercialization, you think about capitalism, you think about selling things. So at that turn of the century point in history where you know things were changing in urban environments, this is the type of font that was uh, starting to make an appearance. So it is a little bit more exciting. Things are getting more geometric. It's a really interesting font. If you look at the Egyptian fonts, they're actually kind of fun to use because you do have this nice horizontal line that connects things, and then you can start to stack things, play off the geometry with the font, really think about design. But this is considered a, um, a serif with no bracketing. You have no bracketing with these serifs. Um, you know, things are, you get, you're starting to get close to perfect circles for the counters, like the O's larger X heights. Um, there's no really contrast between fix and fins at all. There's you know just one standard stroke weight that connects the different aspects of the letter forms together. Question? What's the um, bracketing? Bracketing is where the serifs connect to the main body of the font itself. So with like traditional fonts here. Here's the, the bracketing is the curvature that is basically where the serif extends from the, the font, from the stem, let's say, of the font. So that's the bracketing. So, you know, bracketing is that actual curvature of how it comes out from the stem here, like on the H. So when they talk about no bracketing, it's just basically a very sharp 
kind of Sarah thing. Comes right out. You have a very sharp corner. There's no curvature at all to that in that Sarah. So I mean, it's a very interesting design how you get that feel. And you start to see how there's elements of the font here now that are being created because there's no longer constraints by the technology. So early fonts, you're constrained. You know, first they were handwritten, and then the way the metal was cast meant the fonts could only design particular ways. But you think about industrialization and the tools that were evolving. You know, you had you know, you know, all sorts of things were happening in terms of industry. So different processes were utilized to create fonts that had more unique characteristics. And that kind of led to the idea behind sans serif fonts. So, so here, um, this uh, early sans serif, these were called grotesques, and that's still a, a term that's used today. This is kind of where Helvetica started to evolve out of these types of fonts. Um, so there's no serifs at all. There's a variance. There is some variance between thicks and thins. There's a curve um, stroke that has a slight fat, flatness to it. So you do have some curvature here. Um, but basically no serifs whatsoever, large X height. You know, it's, it's kind of like you're taking the slab serif font and you're taking the, the serif out completely, which is kind of like a, probably a bold and daring thing to do. But there's probably a realization, too, that it was no longer necessary. So again, you're seeing a lot of signage using this type of font. So uh, sans serif, um, humanistic font, mid 20th century, typefaces, are based on humanistic fonts. So they're looking at humanistic fonts as a guide, so the very very earlier fonts to guide the actual letter forms. So you have um, characteristics that convey the idea that it was had some sort of involvement with hand-drawn elements to the font itself in the design decision of the font. And this is kind of where you this is um, where you see Helvetica make its appearance that like, Swiss style. Then you have geometric typefaces. So typefaces like avant-garde and Futura. So you no longer have uh, contrast between strokes. And then you start to get close to perfect circles and um, very conventional types of angles that are used. So another fun font to play with, but really um, pushing the modern look. And then you have these types of fonts now um, that are based off of a chiseled look. So this is um, an incised um, type font. And then uh, calligraphy based fonts as well. So these are some of the um, different script fonts that are based off of handwriting. Then you have formal scripts and uh, black letter style based on early medieval um, text. So those are the various types of fonts uh, throughout history. Do you have any questions about the whole evolution? I'll put the presentation on Canvas. But as you're going through Illustrator and you're looking at the fonts that you come across, and you start to study the history, you'll get a better sense of what those fonts are. So, you know, as I go through, you can kind of see based on, really based on the serifs. You know, this is called uh, 
Dowdy Old Style. So you know the name gives it away. You, you know, so what type of font is Gil Sam just looking at it? Like on, on its most basic level, Sans Serif. And think about Gil Sans versus uh, Gaudi Old Style. So in what circumstance would you want to use Gil Sans? What does it lend itself to? Like if you were designing, if you were designing like a poster? Yeah, like a like poster. poster. Maybe if you design like an album cover for a you know modern band, let's say. You know, start to look at signage and different applications. What's interesting about digital design is that it's really looking at all fonts now, it's looking at the whole history. So what you have at your disposal is is over 300 years of history within this menu here in Illustrator. And now you can go throughout this menu and kind of take these different fonts and combine them and arrange them and think about that whole history that you have now and the power that that gives you as a designer. You know, that you basically have no limitation in how you design because you have every every single font you could ever imagine there for you. Uh, I want to show you, I have this. So all these under character, if we have to go to character to open them? Yeah, so in Illustrator and in InDesign, we'll talk about InDesign next week, but there's basically I think four places where you can change your font. So if you have the control bar on top and you have that type tool selected, uh, you select a font, you can change it right here. So you have access uh, right in that control bar. So that's one place you can change the font. And what's nice about changing it here is that it automatically updates if you scroll through it and then give a little preview. You can actually change the size. So here you can change the size of that font. And then there's filters here, and if you click on this filter, it shows you the actual classification, which is basically what we went through in that presentation. So it's actually built into Illustrator. So you can see your um, Gothic style font, here's your slab serif font. So if you just want to see all the slab serif fonts, and you know that you have a design that's focused on something that the slab serif would really add to that design, you can click on that, and then you see all the slab serif fonts that you have in Illustrator. Um, then you get into the properties of the fonts themselves, too. So when you talk about different characteristics, in terms of here, you have different X heights. So you have a low X height, uh, a regular X height, and a higher X height. Here with the, um, when we talk about the contrast between thicks and thins, you have your low contrast, um, regular contrast, and you have your high contrast. So the transitional fonts, such as um, Baskerville um, and Bedoni, if I click on this, you'll see um, you know, Bedoni right there, Baskerville. Those are your transitional fonts. So if you want access to, access to those fonts right away, they're there for you. When you thinking in terms of what you're designing, think in terms of what time frame, think in terms of, um, you know, is the is something elegant? Is it here a Baskerville is great for like a wedding invitation maybe? Um, you know, this is like a Victorian style font based on that point in history. You got your different weights here, and then different widths as well. And then you can kind of combine these things. If you want to find um, something that, you, you know, maybe a transitional font um, with serifs, but maybe something without serifs. Um, well, there's really no result there. Um, maybe a script that has a traditional feel to it. This is something called elephant italic. So that's interesting. But you got to think in terms of the letter forms themselves too, and all the qualities those letter forms convey. Kind of go back uh, to the beginning of 
the term or are you talking about symbols as well? And how did the actual individual letter forms uh, work with an idea on a symbolic level? Even working on your logos that you're working on now, what's the right font? What feels right for that particular design? So this feature in Illustrator, where you can actually go in here and uh, filter out these fonts, is a relatively new feature, but it's a great feature to have. So here, um, and then here I pick, I'm filtering out sans serif, regular weight, regular X height with low contrast. So you can see these different variations there. Um, monospace is something we didn't talk about. So monospace is basically your typewriter font. So when um, typewriters became prevalent, this is some of your typewriter type font. We find here courier fonts that you would use uh, for, let's say, within programming type environment, early computer fonts, uh, early fonts for CTR monitor displays are your uh, OCR fonts. And there's a couple other features in here that are nice. So you can um, ship, you know, kind of mark your favorite fonts and um, this uh, cloud feature is for when you activate a font. So if you go into the main type menu, you can go into more um, from Adobe Fonts, and it will open up Adobe Type Kit. And I have to sign in, actually. Uh, actually, no, it's okay. It's not here. Um, so here you can get into more font families and more details. And it's kind of nice, too. It gives you the standard um, layout that you can help figure out if the font feels right, you can choose your own text, and you can activate different fonts here. So if you want to see more sans serif fonts, you know, this is giving you a lot more to choose from. Here it's showing you the actual font foundry. So this is the name here is the foundry business that develop the font. Some of these font foundries have been around for a long time. And so if you want to activate fonts too, you can go here. You can um, double click on that font. And then you just click on this little active activate font here button. And then hit OK. And so you can add other fonts into Illustrator. So if I go back to Illustrator, uh, under this show activated font, sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but it should show up eventually. Um, so the other place to see your typography, the font that's laid out, is here in this font menu. But this one isn't interactive, and it, it's a little bit different in its way of showing you how the fonts are displayed. On the left side, though, you have this O. So this O stands for open type. So what open type is, is a font that you can use either on Windows or um, Mac operating systems. So when you're doing a particular design, and let's say you have to exchange it with somebody else because they're on a different operating system. You want to stick with open type fonts because that's going to ensure that that font um, is going to be transferable to something somebody else. The other thing to remember too, as you're working, you're working on design, and you go to another computer or you share it with somebody else. Generally, you have to give that person the font. Now, the licensing of the font is not going to necessarily let you do that. But it's um, but without the font itself, yeah, that person won't be able to work on the project. So it's not, that's always going to be an issue. Now, this Adobe Type Kit uh, changes a lot of that because you um, 
you can just go here and find that font and activate it, and then you can deactivate it. So it's less of a problem now, but I would say like five years ago, you're working at an ad agency and someone gives you a file and the fonts are missing, well, you, you're stuck. You, know, you can't recreate that design because they didn't give you the fonts. So it was always typical practice to package the files. So when somebody says, hey, give me that InDesign file as a package, you can actually go into InDesign, you hit something called package under file. And what it does is it takes the file, it takes all the fonts, and it takes all the images, and it puts it in one folder, and then you can deliver it to somebody else so they can work on the project. That's typically what you do if you're working with a printer, like a printer printing press. They'll need to have that package to print whatever you want. So if you're going to actually print something, you'll want to give the printer the, the package. Same way with Illustrator too. The, um, do you know the one solution to that though? If I don't have the, if I don't want to give them the font, but I want them to print my poster, what is the solution? We talked about it last time, the typography in Illustrator. Can you create the outline? Yeah, you create, you create the outline. So what you would do is you would um, use a uh, shift control O or shift command O on a map and you give them the font with the outlines. So that's that's always important. I'm always thinking about giving them the font, making sure they have the outline font if you don't give them the font. They'll just get it as artwork, right? Instead yeah, of like art, artwork instead of point. text. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the only problem is is if for any reason you have an art director or a creative director who's all of a sudden like, oh, you gotta change that word, and is that the printer? It's like, well, I converted it to outlines. So they can't do anything at that point. So generally, if you convert to outlines, save a version that you didn't convert to outlines, make sure you have that version just in case. Because there's so many times when, you know, I've been working on a project and I accidentally converted to outlines that didn't save the original, and then somebody wants to change something, and what I have to do now is actually go in and take out an individual letter and kind of replace it somehow. It's like a huge pain. Um, so just make sure you convert the outlines. Um, what do you, how do you do convert the outline? It's on a map. It's Shift Command O. Shift Command O, o all the same time. And on a PC, it is uh, Shift Control O. And once you do that, the font's no longer editable. So Basically, it's no longer uh, editable type. It is now artwork. You cannot make changes. Is that you cannot? Yeah, you cannot make changes. And it also will. If you have a paragraph of text, you can convert the whole thing to outline. So if I do this. And and did you say you convert from? Uh, you bring from fontadobe.com. You you create your own character. You create your own font. Um, no, and that's something outside of Illustrator. There's a program called FontSelf that will let you actually create your fonts. We'll use it in class because I want to take some of your initial assignments and use FontSelf so you can convert those into characters that you can create um, emoticons, let's say. Uh, but no, there's no uh, capability within Illustrator that will let you create a font and let like you actually type it out or create a font and send it to somebody else to load it on their computer. I thought you told us to go to fontsadobe.com and... No, that's different. So when you are searching for fonts to add mm -hmm. to your uh, project, let's say, mm -hmm. what you can do is you go to type and you go to more fonts from Adobe and that gives you the ability to search for fonts that are not already within Illustrator. So you can add additional fonts. And how do you add it to font? To add um, you just click on the font, mm -hmm. double click on it, it opens up, and then you just click here and you hit OK, and then you now it's activated. Like I said, it takes like a while for this to happen sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and here you go, these are the ones that activate. So you, it's this little cloud icon. What is it called when you hover over it? Uh, when I hover over it? Over that, that uh, check, the black one on the top. 
I want to see what it says when you hover over it. This one? No, the, the upper the upper one. About. Yes, yes. This? Uh -huh. This okay. basically tells you you've activated fonts from uh, <coughs> the website, basically. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so basically you can add additional fonts mm -hmm. to Illustrator and InDesign and Photoshop. They all kind of, it all works the same way with those pre programmed. Yeah. So you really have access to lots and lots of fonts. Yeah. Earlier on, before this feature existed, that was not the case. You have to go to the font foundries and buy those additional fonts. Or basically, you know, between the designers, you, know, you would hand off um, pirated fonts. So somebody would give you like a thumb drive with like thousands of fonts on them, and you'd build these font collections, but technically that is not legal. You know, so you're pirating the fonts. But every single designer out there would do that. So it's very common. So for the record, this is broadcast level, so I don't do that. You don't need to do it anymore, actually. So it doesn't matter, because you have access to so many. And there's all these websites now that have all these fonts freely available to you anyways. So it's really not, it's really not an issue. Uh, you can find the fonts through Adobe, and basically get what you need, as long as you have the Creative Cloud account. So it's part of the Creative Cloud. So it's a great thing to have, actually. So um, let's see. I kind of want to go through, I kind of want to show you more fonts. Um, just, uh, quick, let me try something here. Uh, but before I do that, let me talk about the assignment. Now, so I will post this in Canvas uh, momentarily, but let me show you what it is. And I'll kind of go through it as a demo in class. And the basic idea behind this assignment is basically an opportunity for you to explore different fonts and really start to more in depth see the whole variety of fonts that you have available to you start to take different fonts and combine them in different ways and become a little experimental with what you're doing. So assignment four. Um, is called, I call it Biotypes Archetypes. And Archetypes is a name. <coughs> I made up the name Archetypes. So kind of based off of the word architecture and archetype combined. So the idea is I want you to create a picture integrating one image with typography. So the photograph you choose can either be of a building or a person. So just think in terms of architecture or bodies. You got two choices. It could be some sort of architectural feature, a building itself, part of the city, anything like that. Or it could be maybe a person and maybe even you. Take a photo of yourself. So either buildings or bodies. You got to choose one. I want you to, with the body one, don't choose a crowd of people, just choose one person. But with the building, you can choose like a cityscape type building. Um, also, I want you to think about the mood. So think about how type conveys mood. So some types can be, you know, can convey humor. Some types can conveys a serious tone. Some types can be, you know, different types of emotions, you know. So types in themselves initially were not designed to convey emotion or, you know, any type, anything beyond readability. But as type evolved, eventually based on the shape and the form, some fonts do convey emotions in different ways. So for me, like slab serif or the Egyptian serif have like a feeling of strength. There's a feeling of stability. Um, with some um, sans serif type faces, maybe humanistic type faces, you can do things that are more kind of fun and lighthearted and comical, um, depending on the type of sans serif font. So explore the fonts in Illustrator and then integrate those into what you create. Um, 
the image itself that you choose, I want it to be a vector that you basically turn into like a silhouette. So that's easy to do if you use image trace, because whatever photo you take, it's going to have that silhouette type feel. But integrate the type into that. Now, when you use the type, you can rotate it and you can flip it, but you can't distort it. So I want you to keep the integrity of the letter forms intact. You'll see a lot of examples where people do this and they distort it and kind of do almost like a like a psychedelic 60s poster where the type is wavy and undulating with on, on the page itself. But keep the, the type intact. You can use the whole font, but the other key part of this is still keep it in black and white. So I still want you to work in black and white. So here's one example. Um, this particular designer, how she went about what she was doing. So the dress, you know, becomes um, made out of lines of type. You have uh, somebody mentioned uh, Randa mentioned Arabic for the actual like tunic kind of shirt she's wearing. Mm -hmm. So that's one way to go about it. Um, nice little detail here. We have text coming. Um, following the baseline, the curvature of the baseline. Um, here's another example of like a city scene using this particular font uh, and how everything is laid out to recreate the architecture. So those are the two different examples. I have this link here that gets into more examples. So different applications. I think um, here's one application though. So for this assignment, this is really exemplifying what I want you to do in a way because the type is not distorted. The same way with this, here the type is not, oh, what? The type is not distorted in that image. Um, but with some of these, um, this is a good example too. That's a really good, good example. Um, what, what I don't want you to do is something like, something like this because, and I think this would be harder for you to do anyways, but you see how the type is beginning to be deformed in different ways. Um, it's warp, warping of the type, distortions of the type. I don't want you to distort it. So keep the type integrity intact. And these are some common examples of how this project can be done. Now, there's a couple of artists out there who I like. One is Elliot Girls. Now, he's not doing what I want you to do in the assignment, but his work is interesting because he does start to combine um, bodies with typography in kind of really interesting ways in his compositions. He's the um, chair of the des design division at a school in Michigan called the Cranbrook Academy of Art. Uh, do you ever remember the movie Eight Mile? You saw the movie Eight Mile? Mm -hmm. You know how Eminem gets in the rap battle with this other guy? And like the movie ends, where it's like, it's like, and he went to Cranbrook, and like people start cheering because Cranbrook was like a preppy school, and he was supposed to be like his competitor, he was a tough urban kid, and he wasn't. He was just kind of like this rich kid who was kind of making it. Um, so, anyways, Cranbrook has this kind of preppy school, in the nice part of Michigan, and then they have this design school, which is one of the actually top design schools in the country. Um, so Elliot Earls is the chair, but he's very experimental. So there's a part of type history that goes beyond, you know, when we went through old style, then transitional, and then slab serif, um, modern slab serif, and then sans serif. Well, you get to our point in history now, and you can say that there's something called postmodern typography, the postmodern type of look, and Elliot Earl's work kind of exemplifies that. So the idea behind postmodernism is basically a reinterpretation of modernism, and that's where you start to see this experimentation with letter forms, um, distortions. But he does a lot of interesting things with 
um, in his poster where, where he is taking um, bodies and kind of integrating type into the body itself. Um, really pushing the boundaries of readability. Um, something like this image. Anyways, um, this is some of his work. Um, another artist that I think about is uh, April Greener. Um, so she is a very uh, well-known graphic designer. And you may see this poster um, uh, a lot, but incorporating a body into the poster itself. If you drive down, um, Wilshire and Vermont, um, and you look, um, there's a, uh, you look at where the subway, the underground, whatever train station is there, and this is, have you guys seen this? Oh, yeah. This is her work. So basically, if you look at her body of work, this kind of exemplifies it. Do you guys? Have you guys driven through by this? Do you know what it is when you drive by? Like a bolt. A what? It looks like a bolt. It's like a huge thumb. It's like a giant thumb, and it's um, just the way it's painted on the, the building. Um, but you could say that this is like new wave style typography. Uh, has a certain aesthetic. You know how I showed you Art Chantry very early on in the term? He was considered more like punk rock, and this was considered like more new wave. And then you get into some artists. Um, that's a great job. What? That's a great job. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. This is, uh, um, I used to drive by this. So when I lived in Koreatown, this wasn't built yet. And then they're, you know how they're extending like the purple line, you know, the gold line? And every time they do a stop, like at each stop, it's a, they do something with the architecture and they make it interesting. Well. This is an, an example of that. Um, but I always looked at it, I was like, what is that? And it was like, oh, it's April Greenman. Um, eventually I realized who it was, so it's pretty cool. Um, but you start to look at how she's experimenting with design and proportion and color. Um, it's almost like with digital technology and the evolution of typography, you, know, you start with this very formalistic approach, and then you really push the boundaries of the visual, you know, medium itself to actually, you know, go into these very kind of abstract forms. But how are you going to add the words to the shape that you're bringing in? Okay, yeah, I mean that's a that's a good point. So, so this is what I would do. So you can do it a couple different ways. So. You know, take a picture. Um, here, I'm going to switch. For the demo, I'm going to play. Um, you're watching this live. Now it's me. So, uh, here, I'll show you. Um, so, take a picture of yourself. Or a picture of a building. Yourself. If you want to, or a building, or whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, right, so here, this is. Um, is this right now? You can look back here if you want. So, I don't know if there's a delay. So I'll take a, I'm just going to take like a selfie of me, right? So here's me. All right. So I got my picture. You can be, it can be you, but it doesn't have to be you, right? I'm not saying it has to be you. You have a choice between you and a piece of architecture you will. You can take a picture of the room, you know, if you want. 
then I'm going to take this and um, what I what I've been doing lately is using Discord for if I'm going from like a, a Mac like my phone to a PC it's kind of hard right because you have AirDrop with the Macs um, but Discord is nice because it um, on my phone it knows I'm using Discord so I just throw things into my um, Discord channel oh I gotta log in Um, in a way where you have a little bit of the image, like you saw in Elliot Earl, Earl's posters, where he's um, he he takes like half of a body and has type coming out of the body. Um, so here, I threw. Here's my picture. Oh, I got that old picture. I can use that one. But here, I'm going to just copy this image mm -hmm. and throw it into Illustrator. So just cut and paste. And then use Image Trace. So there, I mean, to me, that's pretty cool, just hitting image trace once and just getting that kind of silhouette, right? Um, and then, um, you know, you hit expand. Why did you use expand here? You have to use expand if you want to manipulate oh, I see. To the vectors. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I um, here, using the erase tool, it's good to get rid of some of this stuff. You don't want to get rid of everything, but you may want to get rid of some of that. Right? And then... You're shaking your head. Yeah, I'm giving myself a haircut. <laughs> so, this is what I look like when I shave my head. You're shaving your head. So, actually, I don't like that. Yeah, that's a good haircut though. Um, so taking that now, and then you can do whatever you want with the image. Like if you want to rotate it, um, hit R. So you're gonna be doing a lot of rotating. And if you want to flip it, you can use the reflex tool and that's O. And then you can flip something too if you want. But now think about like fonts and typography and what you can add to this. You, when you start to do this now, you want to think about layers. So here, start to organize with layers. And I see something. I had to do some work quick. Um. 
this. Can you create a new layer? Yeah, create a new layer and try to create new layers every so often because if you have a lot of type, it's going to be really complicated. And remember to make your layers nice and big. So I like to go in here, go into panel options, pick 120, let's say. So now I can actually see what's in the layer itself. And then um, start to think about you know, fonts and what fonts you want to use. So as I start to go through my fonts, it's best to use the character palette versus you know, using um, going, going into type and picking the character there under font. Because mm -hmm. here at least I can basically use the type tool. And when you drag the, drag the type tool out <coughs> with the left mouse button, it creates a text box. You let go and it fills it with this more of lips of text. So it fills it with the text. Then shift control, make it bigger. And then start to um, highlight sections and explore fonts. You know, so I like the slab serif fonts. So I'm going to go into my slab serifs, see if I find something with a heavier weight. Um, so go back, slab serif. Here it's Rockwell, you know. Oops, I lost it. Um, so Rockwell. What do you see, slab serif? Um, slab serif or Egyptian serif, serif, um, sans serif, or serif fonts are are the fonts that don't have any bracketing. So if I zoom in a little bit here, go back, Rockwell. Are you changing the font? Yeah, so I want you to start exploring different fonts, mm -hmm. seeing, seeing how different fonts work, um, using a combination of fonts to combine with the image. Either the image is made out of fonts themselves. So what you're going to have to play with now is basically fonts that are outlined. So now I can take all these fonts here. Actually, I'm going to. Maybe say, um, select some more of these. Maybe, um, maybe I want to do something about my hair. Maybe use um, script font. Yeah, use as many as you want, you know, just lots of fonts, explore different fonts. I'd rather have you use lots of fonts than just use one font. You know, and explore scale. Um, here I wanted to find a thinner script font. It's a really hard one. That's just kind of like a browser to see the styles. Yeah, let's kind of browse through. And then after you find fonts that you like, what you're going to have to do is convert to outlines. So if I convert to outlines in a paragraph, it's all set in one group now. They're all outlines. And then the next thing you're going to have to do is go into object and ungroup them. So now you can click on individual letters. You use your regular selection tool. If you use the um, direct selection tool, what happens is you click on a letter and it's only clicking on like point and you'll distort it. So you want to basically convert to outlines, ungroup, and then have your individual letter forms um, selectable. And then play with um, organizing the type in different ways, um, playing with scale. If you hit E, He's a nice tool, tool um, shortcut because it lets you bring up the scale tool and you can rotate as well. And then you're going to play with the color. So I want you to stick with black and white. 
What did you do before grouping and ungrouping? You converted to outlines. How did you do that? It's um, on the map, it's shift command O. On a PC, it's shift control O. And if you also go into type, it is um, under type here, it's create outlines. So create outlines. Under G? Type? Under type in the menu. And there's create outline? Yeah, or the shortcut is sh shift control O on a PC, shift command O on a Mac. So, um, yeah, I want you to start looking at the design and seeing how you can. I don't know why that. But keep it. So when you did create outline, you did grouping and then ungrouping? You have to, when you do a create outline on a paragraph of text, all that text is going to be grouped. And really for this assignment, you're going to have to ungroup the outline text out of that paragraph and be able to select individual letters. Oh, okay. And then you use the regular selection tool, which is B. Don't use um, direct selection, because the direct selection tool will basically drag the points out and distort the letter form. So you just want to make sure you're dragging things out character by character. So it's the black, not the white, that directed. Right, the, the black. The black arrow. Yeah. Selection tool. Correct, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so then thinking about compositionally, how you can integrate the type into that image. Um, let's see. If I take this image of me and I duplicate it, duplicate the layer itself. Actually, I want to just finish with the, um, the word here. here. So I have that R. I'm making the fill white, the stroke, keeping the stroke black. Take E, make it bigger. So I have uppercase letters here and a lowercase, but that's kind of fun, I think. Um, you can fill this with text as well if you want to. There's actually probably a couple different ways to do that. So if I duplicate myself, because I want to keep the silhouette silhouette of myself intact, so I'll just grab this and drag it onto a little piece of paper. Now I have two layers, and I can turn that one off. You can select the, um, the vector here, go into your type tool, click on area type, um, and it's saying it must be a non-compound, so actually what I have to do is, you might have to click on this and go into object compound release. And you might also have to go into ungroup. So now I can select individual pieces, but each one of these little specks on my shirt is like individual keys, and that's individual keys. Uh, but if I go into the area type tool and I click, it's still saying that. So I might have to click on it one more time. Sometimes you have to expand too. That helps. So. There you go. So I clicked on the path itself. And now I filled it with this lipsum forum text. It's like all of it. And Use shift control in your less than symbol or shift control comma. And then I'm just going to go control A and then control A to select, control C to copy, and just paste it a bunch of times. So now I just filled myself with type, right? And now, so that's one of the things you can do too in this project. And then go back to my original and then select all that type. And just make it um, the type itself. Select it all. Give it a fill with, of white, but give it no outline. Now I just filled myself that silhouette with um, 
Did you say control A and then control C or control V? You do have control A to select all of your type, a control C to copy it, and a control V to paste it multiple times. Okay. Right now I got something like that. Um, so that's a, how you see some of those compositions and how they're filled with um, type. Uh, you can do it both ways. Um, you can fill it with type like this, or you can do it manually. You can also, um, what you also you may want to do with this too is change the spacing of the type itself. So you make, uh, make your letting a smaller value. So under the character menu, you have your first thing here is the font family. Then under here you'll see like regular, you might see italics. So then you have that um, aspect of the font family, the font style down here. Here you have your font size. This is where you use shift control um, greater than less than symbol to make it bigger or smaller, but you can do it manually as well. And then here is your letting. So if I decrease my letting, it's going to fill up that space more, make it really thick like that. I, if I made this um, black, let's say, now, make it tight. Black, I don't even need that, um, my background anymore. It's, it really starts to, you know, fill in that space. So I'm using a small, Point size for the font. Here I'm going to copy it again and paste, 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 and decrease that letting. You can even decrease it to such a point where oops. what do you call the whole process? For the whole process? Mm -hmm. uh, I filled in the vector using the area type tool. I increase the size of the font by using shift control less than symbol. And, um, and the next thing I do is uh, decrease the letting. Now what do you call the whole thing? Like? And, and to fill it up with text, <coughs> like that, I use um, control A to select everything, control C to copy, and then I paste it a bunch of times. So now it's, yeah, a little bit of time. So it's kind of a cool effect to do something like this. So are we using the text for like the default when you look at the text tool? Or are we making up our own words? Yeah, make up your own words. Don't, don't use uh, Lorem Ipsum. Lorem Ipsum is just like a common filler text that's always used when you don't know what the copy is. You know, you don't know what the text is for that project you're working on yet. So you may have a copywriter supply the text for you. Um, but yeah, yeah, use um, your own words. Yeah. Um, is there any questions about, you know, you have a lot of creative freedom here. It's just make sure you uh, don't distort. I don't want you to distort the letter forms. I want you to keep the letter forms as intact as possible. So any questions about the assignment? Okay. Um, oh, the size. Um, make it 11 by 17. It can be portrait or it can be landscape. And for the, your final upload, save it as a um, PDF file. And again, try to experiment with as many fonts as you can. Think about everything. Think about scale. Um, think about position. Think about how you layer things, overlapping. Kind of fun when you get rid of a stroke, let's say, and overlap. 
we have like white text now and it's kind of knocking out. So you get something like that. So really think about the layering of what you're doing. And that's where the layers are going to be really important. So as you add the type, add a layer. What happens is you get really engrossed in the project and you forget to add layers. And then all of a sudden you have this composition where you want to go back and select something, but now it's like um, embedded way down within the project. You know, it's like, well, I need the what's that shape? You know, where's that? At? You know, it gets really difficult. So if you separate your layers, it's really helpful. Um, even naming the layers, so you can double click on a name, name it, and then you can double click on these little labels too, for the, or double click the layer itself, and you can change the, the color of the label. So sometimes that helps. But really think about creating new layers as you progress through the project. It's just going to help you. So I'd like to, um, yeah, just, and just really think about pushing it experimentally. Think in terms of how, the, like, April Greenman I showed you and LA Girls. You know, they're really just kind of pushing the boundaries of imagery. You know, they're just pushing the software as much as possible to find like creative ways to explore composition. That's why I wanted to do this demo because I wanted to have some fun working on stuff. Um, See, I mean, what do you think? Is that good? No. Can you do that? Sure. Do it. I mean, do whatever you want with it that confines to the assignment. So you can do this, but don't add color. You know, some people may be tempted to add color. Don't add any color. Um, rotate things, though. Overlap things. I got this assignment from this book, of, you know, about typography and different assignments, and. I was going through it, and the assignment was more basic in terms of the images. It was about just taking whatever image you want and creating the whole image with a font. But I just like the idea of kind of keeping it focused on buildings or bodies, buildings and bodies. You know, because there's something about, especially bodies combined with typography, that's interesting about the combination for some reason and how it reads symbolically. You see a body and you see the words. Because you don't read really bodies, but you kind of do in a way. You know, right? And then words, you don't, words you have to kind of decipher a little bit. So there's a nice interplay between the two of them. And overlapping um, things and um, Scale, you know, make sure you go to scale. You're going to want to hit shift as you drag, just so you don't distort. The other interesting thing about converting to outlines is once you convert to outlines and you make these selections and you start to grab things, um, you really start to play with like the rhythm and the variance of the structure. One thing you might want to do now too is as you're working, if you do have enough layers, you can lock layers. And that's where where I can grab some text. And pull it aside, let's say. Grab it again. Just with the direct selection tool. So if you have any questions about the process, just let me know. But again, 
I will post this on, this is already on YouTube. Right, so you, you, know, you can watch this again if you need to refer back to the keyboard shortcuts. Is there any questions then um, about the assignment? I want you to stick with bodies or buildings. So stick with those two subjects. Bodies or buildings. And it can be autobiographical. Um, both ways can be autobiographical. You can, maybe it's the building you live in, right? You know, maybe your, your house is rat infested. Maybe, I don't know. You know, maybe it's not, you know, but then you put the words rat and all over the place. I don't know. Maybe you can make a political statement somehow, you know. Maybe if you're really hungry, you can use words to describe the things you want to eat and overlay it over your, you know, over your body in some ways. Um, you know, so yeah, just all sorts of things. How can I make this picture go even though the this? Well, I want you to start, I guess one thing though that's important is start with um, a photo. Well, that's a drawing. I'd rather you start with a photograph, because you're going to get a better silhouette. When you say silhouette, what do you mean? Um, silhouette is the, you know, when you, um, it's just your, yeah, it's just your shape. So when you do that image trace, you get a silhouette. Question. Uh, it's like for Adobe, like how to log in. Oh, use your. Um, you should be able to use your Canvas, Canvas. ID and password. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll send everybody this link. Does this help you to put it on um, YouTube? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, you. and if something happens, I don't know, I mean, think about it. Like, potentially, they, schools are already, like, Going being on. closed, right? Yeah. It's like, I think, somewhere on, you know, whatever, because of the coronavirus. So, um, if something does happen, they'll be this available to you. So, I'll do this. You know what I mean? If I have to do it from home, I'll still do it from home. So that way, you can get credit for the class, you still get a grade. You know, it doesn't like interrupt your academic progress. If we do what? Um, I'll, if something happens in terms of where Pasadena City College decides to say, hey, you know what? There's a case, you know, somebody here could get the coronavirus, let's say. Like, hopefully it doesn't happen, <coughs> but somebody could get it. Um, somebody gets sick. The school might deem it necessary. My daughter's college already, they send a message saying they're uh, uh, yeah. online until end of the month. Um, yeah, exactly. They'll say it's online, and we'll still have classes online, just like this. So 
So how do we go? How do we access? I'll give you guys a link. So you'll just go into Canvas, and there'll be a link, and you can just watch it. Um, so, for instance, this class is. Yeah, so you'll, there's no reason why we can't do this now, right? It's, you can watch it on your phone, you know, it's, 